I have a standing desk, but I'm sitting at it. I got my Shakespeare. <laughs> and I got some um, pillows too, so let's see. Is that better? Okay, don't tell the bar that I'm sitting on his collected works. <laughs> So I remember when I was in 10th grade, my flute teacher every spring and every fall had a studio recital where each student was encouraged to perform. My older sister, Amelia, is two years older than me. And she came to this studio recital, which I had been working on very hard for a very long time. And she told me afterwards that she, she sat in the back row and just sobbed the entire time that I was playing. And I hadn't really realized until that point how, how proud she was of the work that I had been doing. <laughs> Just as Amelia told me that she was very proud of me, I am so proud of the work that she does. Amelia lives in Austin, Texas, where she works for the Central Texas Food Bank. She studied food poverty as an undergraduate. She moved to London to do her master's, and she immediately came back to the United States and moved to Texas, where she started working at the food bank basically as a volunteer, living off of food stamps herself. Right now, because of the pandemic, the lines of cars waiting for distributions have been so long that they've disrupted bus service throughout the city of Austin. In some places, they've seen the need for food double, and in other places, they've seen it increase tenfold. A lot of families depend on school lunch programs to feed their children, and since children are not going to schools right now, that's not happening. Pretty much every point along the production chain is, is pinched. The food banks are not getting the same amount of food that they would normally get donated to them from grocery stores. So I asked my sister what could be done in order to help, and she said that the, the best thing that you can do right now is donate money directly to your local food bank. That will help feed people in your community. This piece by Claude Debussy is only about a three minute piece of music, but it encapsulates so many different emotions. It, it you know, it has, glimmers of hope, it has pain and anguish and suffering, and I just hope that this performance will allow all of us to, to feel a little bit of hope despite the fact that we are in a very difficult time right now. And I hope that Amelia and her colleagues, who are all working very hard, will take this as a musical tribute to the hard work that they are doing.
In terms of this moment, mm -hmm. we're in the middle of the pandemic. We're in the middle of the protests. Tell me about the song. Okay, yeah. Um, revolution is about change. It's about feeling that something unique and different is on the way. It's been a struggle for black people, you know, in this country and, you know, we forget, we forget what's happened. There's a lot I feel like this country has to um, explore and understand and comprehend about itself and, uh, and how it's gonna move forward and how it's gonna be just something different. Transformation, that's what revolution is about. Yeah. Thank you. 
One thing that I, I'm increasingly coming to realize, not just about being an artist, but being an adult human, is like we're all constantly just learning on the job. It's like no one knows anything. So yeah, we're here with, with, with Timo Anders, who's an amazing composer and pianist. I believe the Oregon Symphony is slated to perform your piano concerto. That's right, the Blind Bannister. Tell me about that piece, if you wouldn't mind. Yeah, it's a really, it's kind of a, a, a compact, romantic concerto, all squashed into about 20 minutes. The title is also a reference to the wonderful Swedish poet Thomas Tronstromer. He wrote about Schubert's music as the blind banister that guides his way in the darkness. Awesome stuff. Really awesome. Oh, thank you. So I appreciate that. I wanted to show everyone um, how I put together a pot of beans. They're a pantry staple. They're inexpensive. You know, what, what could be better? I have a pot of beans that have been soaking in warm water. I'm going to preheat my oven. Let's say 275. I'm going to drain the soaking water from my beans. I've heard it makes them less gassy. So, I mean, unless you're like a James Joyce type who enjoys that. Put some fresh water on your beans. Cover them by two or three inches. Start those uh, on your stovetop. You want that liquid because it gets delicious and flavorful. Meanwhile, I've got a, a bunch of stuff I'm going to add to the bean pot here. A couple kind of tragic carrots from the bottom of the fridge. Large stalk of celery. An onion. How many carrots should I put in? Should I just break these in half? Uh, it depends on how carroty you like. Four or five large cloves of garlic. The Parmesan rind, just throw that in the pot. What's next? A large strip of zest. A few peppercorns. Don't let me forget. As long as you're careful and you don't add too much, because it's going to cook down, Adding salt is good because it gets into the beans and flavors them as they cook. Let's call it a tablespoon. And last but not least, I've got some nice bay leaves here. Give your bean pot a good stir. If your beans are boiling, then it's time to put them in the oven and forget about them for a while. You know, for a long time, I think accessibility and, and even audience were dirty words to composers in the in the 20th century. I love thinking about the audience and I, it's something I think about um, all the time when I'm working. And so the form this takes for me is like a kind of obsession with getting my ideas into the simplest form possible. Needing to write different types of pieces for different types of forces and groups and musicians and how can I give these people something that will make them sound good and something that that will interest me compositionally. I recently noticed on Instagram that you had come across a, a large cache of, of rhubarb. <laughs> well, it came across me, actually. <laughs> I wanted to ask, what became of all that? Yeah, it was a sort of rhubarb windfall. I'd ordered what I, I thought to be a large quantity of rhubarb, 10 pounds, and then 20 pounds arrived. You know, I'm never one to turn down a good deal, which basically meant I made a huge pot of rhubarb compote. I filled this to the brim with rhubarb. And much of that compote remains in my freezer to this day. You know, you're a composer performer, um, but you're mm. also a champion for other composers. You know, I think part of part of that is being able to throw our support behind uh, people, and in particular other musicians and artists. Um, so that's something I've been trying to figure out ways to do. I enjoyed the, the video of Gabriella Smith's imaginary epic. pancake. I love putting myself on that other, the other side of that composer performer divide. When Carnegie offered me that commission as part of the recital, I immediately just thought, let's commission someone whose music I admire. And I just hope that other pianists hear the piece and take it up. I found it really, really rewarding to play, and I, I hope I'll get to play it a lot more. Well, and maybe it, it might not be too soon to uh, give, the, give the beans a quick check. All right, should we do it? 
Well, these smell delicious already. I think the beans are done. Can I ask you about the piece that we're going to hear? Absolutely, yeah. It's one of a, a set of three piano pieces called Moving Etudes. An etude will usually have a topic, you know, playing in octaves or playing arpeggios. And I sort of got this idea to write a set of etudes that were more about rhythm, push and pull, tempo, rubato. I'm playing here the second one in the set, which is called Bivegd. And I guess it means sort of roughly emotional, but it's a very sort of heightened emotional feeling kind of worried, very stormy. And that is sort of the double entendre of the title Moving Etudes, which is I, I wanted these pieces to reflect emotional states. And this piece has this repeating pattern is this kind of falling four note figure, which repeats over and over and over. And in these kind of cycles with increasing urgency over the course of the piece. It's been great to talk to you. Um, you too, James. I look forward to performing your music in the future in various venues at the Oregon Symphony. I look forward to that too. And um, and thanks for helping me uh, uh, with get my bean game on here. Well, you know, teach a, teach a man to fish, as they say.
Hey, it's Timo. Thanks again for watching this episode of Essential Sounds. Of course, one of my great pleasures in life is to cook up a big pot of beans for my domestic partner. And uh, that's not to say I take beans for granted. Um, we're currently experiencing one of the biggest hunger crises that the United States has ever seen. And to that end, the Oregon Symphony is partnering this week with the Oregon Food Bank, which annually serves hundreds of thousands of Oregonians facing food insecurity. You can make a donation to them by following a link at the bottom of this video, and that will go to support members of this community who are in need. Thanks again for that. Thanks for watching and uh, enjoy the music. Thank you. 
Thank you.